Good evening. Thanks so much for being here. I'm Michelle White, Senior Curator at the Manil Collection, and I'm really pleased you're here and made it through the rain. As you know, we reopened, we just reopened the main building at the end of September. And when we were renovating the building, we also completely reimagined and reinstalled our permanent collection. So if you haven't explored the galleries yet, please come back soon to see all of the changes. So tonight's program is the second in a new monthly series called Artist Talks, where we're highlighting artists in the permanent collection. And I'd like to thank Francie Neely for supporting this series. The series will continue um, in January with a talk by Trenton Doyle Hancock, and later in the season with Maniko Grimmer. Um, before I begin the introduction, I just want to say that the artist will be taking questions at the end of the talk, so if you can hold off until then, I know she's excited to, to have a conversation after. It's my great honor to, to introduce tonight's speaker, artist Susan Frakon. Susan was born in Pennsylvania, and she studied both at Penn State and the Ecole Nationale Supérieure des Beaux-Arts in Paris. She currently lives and works in both New York City and upstate New York. Susan's work is currently on view in our contemporary galleries, and I hope you've seen the remarkable painting, which she'll talk about tonight. Susan's work was first presented here at the Manil in her solo exhibition, Form, Color, Illusion, in 2008. And it's a show we organized with the Kunst Museum Bern. And I will just point out, we still have copies of the catalog in the bookstore, and Susan's kindly uh, signed a few if you don't yet have a copy. As many of you know who were introduced to Susan's work here as I was in that exhibition, she is best known for her extraordinary use of color an intense use of color, which she calls her the driving force behind her work. The artist hand grinds earth-based pigments to realize her luminous abstract paintings and works on paper, which she has been making since the 1970s to much acclaim. One critic recently wrote, and I loved this statement, it was so beautiful. He said, at a time when many institution and observers continue to claim that painting is an obsolete practice, Frekon has quietly become a major artist. I actually think the best way to understand Susan's work is through her evocative titles, which she gives to the work after they're completed. A few of my favorites are Embodiment of Red, Lapis Ordering Adjacent Blues, Vertical Purple Forbidden Enclosure, and Indigo Light. The titles, like the artist's works, state the primacy of form and the transcendent possibility of an arrangement of color through painting. Susan, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, <laughs> Michelle. Um, Welcome, everyone. First of all, I'd like to very sincerely thank Rebecca Rabinow, the new director of the Manil, and the curators and the en entire wonderful Manil staff who made this occasion possible. And thank you, Marcella Durand and uh, the staff at David Zwerner, the wonderful staff at David Zwerner Gallery for aiding me in preparing this talk on my work. I'd like to offer my heartfelt thanks to Joseph Helfenstein for bringing my paintings into the Manil during his tenure as director and curator. And I'm delighted for my work to be part of this amazing collection that comes from all over the world and from many diverse cultures. I'm infinitely grateful to Dominic and John de Menil for their huge contribution to the enlightenment of humanity, not only in the arts, but concerning social justice as an integral part of their vision always for the betterment of the individual, as well, as well as for the entirety of human consciousness. That my painting could be a small piece in this vast context is indeed rewarding to me as an artist. 
The superb housing of this museum is, alas, too unique in that every work of art shown here can be seen and experienced to its maximum potential. The result, of course, is due to the insights and thoughtfulness of the Germanils in not only choosing art that they loved with passion, but it, in exhibiting it in conditions of the truth and multidimensionality of natural light, context, and spaciousness. And any human being who desires to enter and partake of the art can do so because it's free, <laughs> no admission fee. <clears throat> Art is a wordless experience. There really is no explanation. To me, art is art when it reaches a point where I can't really explain its content, a plane beyond understanding, an enig enigmatic, but you can't forget it. That said, some brilliant and insightful art historians have, ever, have written most beautifully about art. Consider the 30,000-year-old cave paintings. Consider Mimbers potteries made on this continent centuries ago. No explanations. Art appears to be a high form of knowledge beyond words, yet it is interwoven with all other categories of human knowledge. It began when we began, vital to our humanness. I found through working at it that artist painting does not need the embellishment of story. I have spent my life trying to make art painting that has the singular purpose of speaking for itself. How does this happen? How is it built? The painter seeks first and foremost the reality of the painting that it may exist in a timeless visual suspension. The very eloquent contemporary sculptor Fred Sandbach said, I am alone and voiceless. I wish this could ring true for my painting as well, but though I feel I want my work at its best to be voiceless, I am only present at this end of a long timeline of painting that came before me and from which I still learn after many decades. I look at paintings and art continuously. Painting as medium depends on skill of handling and strong composition. In Cezanne's work, for example, one sees it developing slowly and indelibly into greatness through his many years of working. In the paintings of Velazquez, it was incredible to see the almost miraculous handling of oil paint. It's truly illuminating experience when one gets beyond the depictions and the darkened palette, but is drawn entirely and totally into the paint itself and how it was composed and applied. That is the real content. Our very early ancestors took earth colors, mixed them with their medium, and painted. Their visual communication speaks to us now, so many centuries later, and affects our entire being and consciousness. We don't know the story in their paintings. We do not know the personalities of the art makers. There is no gender, religion, race, nor nationality. We can experience the works transporting power and ungraspableness, no matter who we are. So we're going to go to version 13, which um, is in the gallery down there. First comes the reality of the painting. No explanation is a substitute for this. I hope you've had a chance to experience the actual version 13 displayed in the Menil Gallery. If not, I, ho I hope you'll come back during daylight hours the painting is best experienced in natural light, but it, it, it also is very well lit in the artificial light. I have to contradict myself because I prefer natural light, <laughs> but it, it, it's very beautifully lit. So it's best experienced though in natural light um, as it shifts and plays with the surfaces and depths of the paint. There are various elements and, guard, and guidelines that go into making my paintings 
but no hard real rules that can't be broken in the interest of the greater goal of visual success. They're organic, made by my hand. The work comes from the work. At the same time, it comes from the reality that I witness around me in the world. They're not just color next to color. There are, there are very intentional spatial depths created by the oil paint layers and nuances to try to make the art, artwork finally come off the wall and into the space between the viewer and the painting. Everything you see is made up of visual decisions. Each step, ingredient, and stroke along the way of making a painting is a visual decision for me. Every decision is toward the greater, greater visual entirety. When I, when I apply the paint, I need my full focus and all my strength as I paint for the duration for each stroke throughout the day. I paint with the sun and its paths and seasons. This light becomes a part of my paintings. Color is a major driving force in making my art. My colors are choices are first and foremost chosen, chosen for their hues and tones in my compositions. Some come ready-made in tubes from various paint manufacturers. I grind and mix others from raw pigments. I've always been drawn to red earth colors and have used the multitudes of iron oxide pigments continuously. Though I love and use all colors, the red earths are the core of the unity of my work. They are essential, basic, challenging, fascinating, and can be very ugly if my effort fails and goes wrong. I paint by natural light and try to work in tandem with the light being on them and within them. Each red earth tone has different material properties, and I work with that. Some are very dense and opaque, whereas others can be more translucent. Some absorb more oil and are more difficult to grind and manipulate, and the opposite is true. The more I work with them, the more I learn, and the deeper I go into their properties, and it's very interesting. <laughs> The pigments range from more violet shades, for example, Persian red, Kaput Mortuums, Snifels, the Yokel, re Violet Red Earth from Iceland, and so on, to more orange hues such as Pompeian, Pazzuoli, Erculano, Red Ochres, Mars, etc. I use their innate properties to activate the work visually. I, I don't mind that they link me to the first painters that ever used them and that, they, and that they are found in the earth throughout the world, regardless of national boundaries. They're truly universal. I am alone, but I am not alone. Most of the red earth paintings are made from dry pigments, ground or mixed in, oil, in linseed oil. This is another image of the same painting, but um, each, it looks different in every photograph, so you have to see the real thing. <laughs> the red earth pigments I used in version 13 were from top to bottom, English red deep, red ochre, sofa rouge, Mars red, and iron oxide red medium. I hand mixed or ground them from dry pigments. Each hue was realized for the role that it played in the resulting color ranges of the painting. In other words, its re resulting form and appearance. This painting underwent many changes as I fine tuned it over time. The arrangement and structures of close earth reds and their sheens, and I wouldn't really know how the painting would look until each layer had dried. And this, this is the plan to scale for, for the embodiment of red paintings. This is my underlying composition which holds the painting. I can't express how important composition is. I worked on developing compositional strength over years and years. How could I import, impart strength into my compositional composition? so that the underlying foundation would hold the work of art. 
I tried things, abandoned them, then went back to them. I found that paintings that relied only on ideas or emotion often fell apart visually, and relying on the grid or symmetrical geometry could lend work a systematic, predictable, or static feeling. When I first saw Hilma of Clint's work in the 80s, I was struck by her virtuosity as a painter, as well as by her asymmetries in the resolutions. I had been looking for asymmetry in my own resolutions. And seeing her work helped strengthen my intent. Finally, through many, many attempts and trials, I slowly worked my way back into an asymmetrical geometry. The scale is meant to be large so that the painting exists in a full, full viewing space with an overwhelming emanation or presence. I encourage viewers to walk around my paintings so that they can observe them from various angles and viewpoints. When my work is exhibited in natural light, it works with the light and is different each time one sees it. I determine the sizes of all my oil paintings in relation to the human body in inches and feet. This composition was originally titled, There is No Beginning and No End, but it was eventually retitled Embodiment of Red after I completed the first large painting using only red oxides. What is form and what is ground? What areas appear as void or solid? I refer to the compositional areas as empty space and full space and, and deliberately try to activate the visual result as alternating between figure and ground. It makes it more interesting to see the same painting in as many dimensions as possible for the, through the use of the colors, material, compositions, and light. Seeing areas both as darks and lights in the composition can also add to this multiplicity of looking. This is a small wooden pa painting on wood panel preceding the embodiment of red paintings, but using this composition for the first time. Indigo and Prussian were the darker colors, and the reds were a warmer, more orange red, and, and a cooler at the top. I think it was Phoenician transparent um, kind of you can see. As ever, I wanted no depiction or association of anything, landscape, mountain, sunset, architecture, human, no metaphors, no symbols, etc., etc., to be non-objective and having no subject. In this sketch idea, the indigo areas are reversed in the composition. I work out my ideas in small sketches continuously. They are comp back and forth, altering, changing. They are compositions to hold the other ingredients of the painting, the light, the color, the material, and of course the handling of the paint and how it's applied, all of which eventually is the larger form which encompasses the total makeup of the finished work. This is another sketch um, paper, and it, I was at the Menil looking at version 13 when it was first installed some years ago. I didn't have my notebook with me, so while I was looking at it, I made notes on a little piece of paper that I found in my purse. <laughs> These sketches show the progression from indigo areas to all red areas. I intuitively decided to push the composition further by only employing four different earth reds, but which were closely related in tone. I felt I had compromised by using the other colors to help present the reds in the painting, when what I really wanted to do was uncompromisingly use only earth reds and for no other reason than visual impact or result. They should have dissonances and asymmetry, yet finally strengths of harmony and balance. Music, poetry, 
No, actually, but the areas could be relative, only paint. As I build up a painting to its realization, I keep precise notes or mixtures of mixtures, proportions, ingredients, dates, and so on. These are some of my notes for version 13 the embod in the embodiment of Red Series. This large-scale painting titled Pompeian Persian, it's from 2010, is one of the embodiment of red series. The oblique view shows the effect of light on the painting surface and can alternate between negative and positive in the composition depending on the viewer's stance. It's shown here only by natural light from the skylights in David Zorner Gallery. And this is the painting straight on. The pigments used were Caput Mortuum, Pompeian, which is a burnt sienna, Spanish earth, and, Pom and Persian red. The largest paintings measure nine feet tall by 87 and 38 inches wide, as, as version 13. They're composed of two linen stretched linen panels with one stacked on top of the other, or as you will see later, placed flush to each other vertically side by side. The large scale paintings are the heart of my work as a painter. They generate everything else. All the other work is relative to them. The larger the format of the painting, the more exponentially difficult it is to realize and build it to its culmination. But the stronger is the presence for the experience of the viewer. And that is the ultimate reward. I am also the viewer. All the oil paintings are generated by the beginning mean of the height to the length of the stretcher bars. Sofa Rouge, titled after one of the pigments, is another in the large-scale embodiment of Red Series. I remain thoroughly engaged with achieving works in Red Earths. And these two watercolors came from the, the embodiment of Red Paintings. The watercolors are part of the same unity of all my work. They help me see. Hematites was one of the first pigment minerals used by people. The sometimes gritty pigments possess unique properties in color, ranging from blacks and metallic grays of the rocks to browns and reds. Some are more orange and some more violet. The stones have pockets of red into them, which were, were used for the pigments. And um, hence, uh, sometimes people called them bloodstone way in the past because when they found the pockets of red in them, they, they called it the stone that, that bleeds. Anyway I, am, anyway, I employed it for its visual properties and found that surprising things occurred when I used it, such as turning silvery when I build up the paint layers or becoming multiple colors in one pigment or turning so ugly that I had to start over from the beginning layer. I wanted to make some paintings using only this family of earth reds to continue exploring these properties. This medium sized painting is uh, 24 inches wide or two feet and then um, I think about 29 inches high. And it's, it's entitled Hematites and it's oil 
All my paintings are oil and wood panel, except for the watercolors. Because hematites are quite challenging to handle and manipulate, I haven't yet realized four of them together in a large painting. This, this came out a little dark, but it is, it's a dark painting, but it's a kind of dark. And it's also a medium-sized painting, a little bigger than the last one. And it's, um, it's titled Empty and Full Dust from 2013 and 2014. It's oil on two medium-sized stretch stacked linen panels. The title refers to Rumi poems and was part of the exhibition here at the Menil, Experiments of, with Truth, Gandhi, and Images of Nonviolence, 2014 and 2015. Composition in Four Colors Two is a large painting realized concurrently with the embodiment of red series and cathedral variation series. This image indicates some of the play of light on the paint surface. The top green was mixed toward being a celadon hue. The deep red is Persian. Then the bottom is more orange red, and it's a hematite. And the ovoid shape is a slightly translucent delft blue. And this is the same painting lit differently. With, you can see the luminosity of the blue more in this image. Four color composition on small paper one, fountain and shadow. I did a suite of four or five or six very small watercolors on found scraps of old Indian paper that came from the idea of the composition in four colors, and also relating to reading some of Jalaladin Rumi's poems. These were also shown in, ex in the exhibition Experiments with Truth, Gandhi, and Images of, nine, of Nonviolence and they belong, to in the Menil, they belong to the Menil collection. This, this one is titled Four Color Composition on Small Paper, Love Dogs. If you get the catalog for the exhibition, the beautiful poems are reprinted, are reprinted in it. Orange and Purple Composition, 2011. The watercolors are often done on found agate burnished handmade old Indian ledger paper. And you can see the horizontal creases where the paper was folded for the ledger keeping. Unlike in the oil paintings on stretched linen, the format of the paper and its material generate the painting's compositions. <clears throat> I like painting on this paper a lot because of the way it accepts the watercolor paint, a marriage of paint and paper. When I put the color on the paper, it can penetrate into the paper, but it also stays on the surface. And I think I, I like it so much because it's, it's very earthy and material. It's made from rag. And so I can work the paint the way I do with oil paint. And that's how I use watercolor more often than with the transparent layers of watercolor. The, the paper often still bears the visible traces of the archa archaic ledgers and uh, markings. And I think it, I tried to find out what language it was and, and I think it was Sanskrit. To my knowledge, it's no longer made. Um, some Indian painters use this, this old paper too, even, even though it has tears and marks and stains on it. We, you know, I feel a kinship with why they use it because the paper is just so wonderful to work with it that 
I never throw, throw it away if I messed up the watercolor, I wash it off and I start over again and I keep working. And this, this watercolor, I worked it over so you can see how the paper is buckling. It's called Cathedral 2006. And, and it relates to the Cathedral series oil paintings that are coming up. So this was the this was titled Composition with Red Earth and Red Earth, and uh, you've probably seen it on the cover of the Manil catalog. For, it was part of the show entitled Form, Color, and Illumination: Susan Fracon Paintings in 2008 at the Manil. This image shows two large paintings installed in the entrance of the Manil, right over there, from this exhibition. The two paintings benefit from the beautiful natural light washing over them, from specially designed louvered skylights above, as well as from enormous windows to the side. The architect Renzo Piano and Dominique de Menil worked in tandem toward finding the most effective solutions to illuminate the artwork for the collection. And I'm, the, I'm quoting from the book Double Vision by William Middleton. From the beginning of the design process, the primary issue was about the importance of natural light. You can see here that the paintings are low nine inches from the floor, even with the ceiling being quite high. It's important for the large-scale paintings to be hung low, no more than 10 inches from the floor, regardless of ceiling height, so that when one engages with them or enters them, their physicality is felt, you know, straightforwardly when you do see them. This is carefully thought out and, and observed on my part. If if they're higher, they tend to feel lightweight or floating. And that plus the white surround at the bottom compromises their gravitas. They're not meant to be de decorations to the exhibition space or subservient to the architecture, but to hold their own independent existence in the space and be most accessible to the experience of the viewer. And this is the plan to scale for what became the cathedral series. In my work, one thing leads to another. And this composition came after and from the embodiment of red composition. Each area is proportionately related. I had recently visited at Ma um, the magnificent Chartres Cathedral. The experience impressed itself into my mind forever. I tried to understand its proportion by researching in, in the many books written about the building of it. What went into its complexities, which had made it such, a, such an important, great, monumental work of art. I read a passage in a book by Fulcanelli, the, the Mystère des Cathedrales, describing the multicolors of the original cathedrals. Imagining the cathedrals in colors compelled me to use this composition in reinventions of combinations of colors. This initial plan for composition with red earth and red earth evolved into the cathedral series. This was the first of the series, a very small oil painting on wood, eight by 10 inches. So why do I do the smaller panels as well? In my mind, the concept has to fit the scale first and foremost. So 10 inches has a nice feel in my hand and eyes, which my hand, that's kind of the span of my hand 10 by 8, I like holding that size and seeing it. Sometimes, as in this case, I make them to experiment with the colors before going on to the large format. 
and sometimes there are variations which come from the large paintings, but ultimately they exist autonomously as paintings. So again, I, I did many sketch ideas, back and forth, finding, noting what colors I imagined them to be, and then executing them. This is Car Cathedral Series Dark Reds on wood panel, and it's 12 feet wide. There were infinite possibilities for the color combinations. Cathedral Series Variations 5 Closer, Large Scale, 2009. Cathedral Series Variation 7, uh, wood oil on wood panel, 2 feet by 29 high. And this is, shows the light from my studio window on the surface, on the shiny surfaces. And Cathedral Series Variation 6, 2010, large scale, it's a large scale painting. Like the embodiment of red paintings, I made many variations and I'm still using this composition. The Cathedral series led to the Book of Paint series. This 12 inch high painting on wood panel was my prototype and it evolved over several years in trying to find the precise colors I desired in the painting. I often went to look at Islamic manuscript paintings and pages in museums. For a long time, I had been trying to resolve the five colors I was working with in Book of Paint. Working a malachite green into the composition was particularly difficult. There was an exhibition of Islamic manuscript painting at the Morgan Library. I needed to see the truth of these colors in my head and in my palette. These small masterpieces lifted and strengthened my resolve and purpose. Though I didn't understand the writing in the manuscripts, I was nonetheless moved by the virtuoso visual knowledge in their execution. Each work was exquisitely painted with beautiful colors. To me, these were books in paint, hence my title, Book of Paint. Also, Book of Paint explains itself entirely in paint rather than in writing. The painting explains itself wholly. This is a large scale version three Book of Paint. In Book of Paint, the light, the light is coming also from behind and within the painting, as opposed to light merely striking the surface. Book of Paint 2, this shows Book of Paint 2 installed in the back room of David Zorner Gallery in 2015. I included this image because I wanted you to see how the natural light illuminates the further gallery more at a certain time of day, while the front gallery shifted into a darker phase. It was interesting to see the changes with the paintings as they were illuminated accordingly to the traversing of the sun's arc. <clears throat> These are very small watercolors and oils of cathedral variations and book of paint compositions in my studio, plus a new compositional idea in progress to the left. This shows watercolors on, with one small oil panel in the back on a table in my studio relating to embodiment of red in the four, composition in four colors, earth takes its guidelines, cathedral series, and terre verte paintings. These were exhibited at David Zwerner, London, 2017 as part of a concurrent 
exhibition of large oil paintings at David Zwirner, New York City. And there's a catalog with both the small work and the large work in it that was, came out this year. This is entitled Tervert Large Scale. It's a large scale painting using only various earth greens or tervertes with varying sheens. Earth greens are very transparent pigments, but I build up the paint layers so that they were more opaque with light still glowing from within them. But I wanted to achieve the sense of the shifting relations in tandem with the physical physical materiality of the painting. And this is an um, oblique view, again at David Zwerner, only lit by north-facing skylights, showing an indication of the sheens, negative and positive, changing as one walks around looking from various angles. So it's hard to emphasize how important light is to paintings. Natural light is the best and most effective in making my paintings and in seeing them. Daylight allows the painting to function in many changing dimensions and more to its maximum potential, thus enriching the experience of the viewer. Natural light is the most true to every element that makes up the painting. The paintings are in constant flux in natural light, whereas in artificial light there is only one fixed way of seeing the work. And of course the colors are off and tend not to be as vibrant or interesting or alive. I like when the colors glow and I wish to have the paintings emerge from the light rather than be flattened by overlighting using harsh uh, spotlights and such. Um, a lot of people put a spotlight on their paintings, but that kind of kills the painting sometimes, especially for me. FRSPO 2016 is a large scale oil painting on linen. The title refers to pigments used, French Rolf, Sienna and purple ochre. So uh, sorry for the quality of this image, uh, but I just wanted to talk about it briefly. Most of the half and whole ellipsoidal areas comprise irregular quadrants in keeping with my intent for asymmetry, imbalance, and dissonance entering into the equation. Again, all the areas relate proportionately to each other. In the plan and paintings, in the middle and on the right, I have turned the double stacked vertical form and format 90 degrees to side by side panels with compositions now generated by the middle, middle vertical separation line of the two panels, as well as the relation of the horizontal and vertical stretcher bars. This is a related watercolor on found old Indian handmade paper. And this is a related oil painting titled Little Annunciata on wood panel using lapis lazuli. And it's 12 inches wide, or one foot wide. And this, this is lap, the lapis lazuli paint mixture for a large painting. I have to mix a large quantity for the large paintings and I have to cover the surface in one um, go. So I start early in the morning to mix it and work through the day. And, um, and the lapis is an extremely beautiful transparent mineral pigment though it's not easy to paint with due to its transparency and texture. Because it was so precious when it first became available centuries ago, it was only used for the most revered pictorial elements, such as the robe of the Madonna in Christian art. 
Now it has largely been replaced by synthetic ultramarine, ultramarine blue, which is certainly also a beautiful color. But there's really nothing that compares to lapis lazuli. When I found it was available in a few brands of oil paint, I couldn't resist painting with it. So the large scale version is still in progress. These are notes for the next painting I'm going to show you, which is titled Lapis Lazuli II Blue God Verona. And it shows, again, it shows the mixtures and the dates and the proportions of the mixtures and so on. The title with Blue God came about because, because Lapis lazuli was used for the gods and goddesses. But I was also enthralled with the skin colors of the blue Hindu gods. Notice that the lapis lazuli of the small painting is not the same as the large painting, though both are lapis lazuli. Each is a different brand and probably from different parts of the globe. I don't know. The same can be said for the earth greens, Verona and Nicosia. It is true for most earth pigments and, en and enters into my visual decisions or vocabularies as to which brands I employ and where they come from. As I said before, my choices are intuitive visual decisions but they're very considered and reconsidered. So I suppose visual and mental are the same without being didactic. Again, all the oil paintings are generated by the beginning relationship or mean of the width and length of the stretcher bars indicated at the top of this diagram as the length and the width and then they become the stretcher, and then I mount the double panel, or I turn it to the side, side by side. Um, I make the curve in proportion to the horizontal. This is the plan to scale for lantern, a painting comprising two irregular but equal quadrants. You can see a middle, the middle vertical line and then the line across to arrive at the curved quadrants. And then this is the large scale painting, composed of indigo built up in layers to be dark, opaque, and matte, and with shiny Spanish red ochre. Again, the oblique view from the most recent exhibition at David Swerner, with the light on the surface, surface causing the negative and positive interactions. Back to hematites. Um, this is a small oil trial on unstretched linen. I'm using a brushy, thinner mixture. Each stroke counts, and the strokes are obviously more visible here. So I'm mixing up a, a big batch of hematite pigment with cold-pressed oil for a large painting in progress. And as I'm painting it, And the completed painting, I titled it Brushwood Hematites, Large Scale. And here, uh, this shows mixing a Mars greenish yellow with oil for yellow lantern. So, the side-by-side -side panels with a side window light in my studio reflected indigo matte and Mars greenish yellow shiny. 
yellow lantern. It, it is not a lantern. Thank you. <laughs> So if you want to see any of the pictures again, I can go back, or if you have any questions. Um, you? It doesn't have a name. I just find it. Um, somebody gave me some one time, and I, I found it in a store in New York one time, and I just could sense that, it, that I would really like this pain. But it comes in long, narrow sheets, so that determines how I compose my painting on it. And I'm sorry, I can't, uh, you'll have to go to India to, I think it's from northern India. What? I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm a little hard of hearing, so <laughs> maybe. I was, saying, I was saying that you referenced uh, handmade Indian paper in another painting, and I was like, maybe that's the name. And, uh, you know, you're saying that there, it doesn't have a name, you know, what, what's the name of handmade Indian paper, right? So, yeah. I'll call it that, right? I, 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 I was, I had a, a friend who traveled to India, and, and he, he um, actually... I don't know if you've ever seen the anonymous Indian tantric paintings, but, but he sort of connected the outside world to these anonymous paintings that were made by only the initiated. You couldn't, um, they were meditation pieces and they weren't really to be brought into the commercial market, but, and they're contemporary and, and the artists go from one to another, but that's a whole other lecture. But he brought, he found some of the painting in Rajasthan and, and brought me a big batch. But um, I try to use other papers too, but I really love the paper. Who else? Oh, hello. How many pieces do you work on at a time? Well, right now I'm working on the large oil paintings. And I'm completely immersed in that, so I haven't really... I need my total focus to work on them. But when I have time, like when my studio was b being built upstate, I couldn't, I couldn't work on the big paintings because they were building my studio and I needed to be there. So I did a whole lot of, um, you know, I put my power into work on paper because I wanted them to be big paintings eventually. And, I didn't do one watercolor and then turn it into an oil. I don't really work that way. But I, I had this, this nice uh, suite of watercolors that related very much to, to the oil paintings that came later. Do you work on more than one oil painting at a time? Yes. Yes, because they're, they're oil, so they, there's a lot of drying time evol involved. So while one's drying, I'll work on another one. So right now, in my studio upstate, I'm, I have four in progress. And then in New York, I have two or three in progress. But they develop slowly, and I like that because it gives me time to really consider and think about what I'm doing. And it's in the nature of oil paint to, de to develop slowly. And the nuance and everything goes along. It sinks in with that. Do you ever work on more than one motif in the, the ones one. you're working on? Do you work on more than one motif in the, in the works that you're working oh, on contiguously? More than one composition, right. you mean? Um, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, thank you for your talk. I'm wondering <laughs> if you can um, talk more about what the use of repetition means to you. The, the use of repetition. Um, oh, by using the same composition? Using the same okay. compositions. And at what point do you feel that a series ends and turns into something, turns into something else? Well, it takes me a long time to arrive at a composition. And, 
and it it's becomes the bedrock foundation of my work. And then I, I orchestrate the colors and, and the material and everything. And, and I just run with it and take it as far as I want to. And it's so interesting. The cathedral series, because of their complexity of colors, I just um, am continually coming up. You know, I think I've finished them. And then I come up with colors that I have to do another, you know, arrangement of colors that has to turn into a. But but when I find a cathedral, um, a composition that I think is good, you know, I want I want to keep using it because uh, it's like using the rectangle of painting, but I want it to be what it is and. I, I can do that. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. Okay. <laughs> Claire. <laughs> so, Susan, when you work on a painting like this, are the, can are the two pieces of canvas together already, or you work on one half and then join the other half? Well, I... I, I um, I work on the whole thing in one day. If I'm putting one layer of indigo, I do it all in one day. I put, I put, take one, I take one stretcher, you know, one panel, and I put it on the table and I paint on it, or I paint. Sometimes I paint upright on it if it, if the color's not too runny, and then I take it down and then I bring the other panel up because I need to. I need to have them as a unity, yes. but yet playing off of the middle stretcher bar, you know, that line in the middle. Mm -hmm. At Is any that... point in your career, did you ever start ever with a blank canvas and, and say to yourself, I don't know what I'm going to paint today? Um, no, that just, that isn't, I do that with, with um, the watercolors all the time. But with the oils, I really, it's very precisely thought out that that's my base foundation for my painting. So I want the strength of composition. It took me a long time to, you know, I, I always felt that um, that was the weak point of many artists and myself included, that the, the painting didn't hold it. And so I, so I got so deep into, into trying to find a way to hold my painting that this is where I am today. And I don't have a desire anymore. I use, you know, my roots are abstract expressionism, so there's elements of expressionism in all my work. Uh, and the painting before this, I let it go, you know, I let the strokes show a lot more. And I'm continuing with that at the same time that I'm uh, not letting the show, strokes show. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I was wondering if it might be possible, you mentioned the word ugly a couple times, that you, as you're experimenting, they get ugly and you have to start again. Is it possible for you to define what that is for you or what that sensation is when the color becomes ugly? Yeah, well, I, because they're oil, I look at my paintings a lot and, and I want to like looking at them. <laughs> and um, this, the, in the previous painting, go back, this one, that color in the middle was so challenging. I, I put it on five times and I removed it five times. I put, you know, I removed it with a paint remover and it was really getting down to the nub of the linen and I knew I couldn't remove it anymore. So, but I thought the color was so fascinating. It's a, it's a very gritty hematite and, it, and I wanted to use that to give strength to the painting. And it, it separates into like, brown and black and, and this orange stain. It's, it's such a strange color. So finally, I, 
I succeeded in the fifth try to get it so that I liked looking at it and I thought it could work. And then the, the other color is the hematite too and that, um, that turned out right the first time. It was, it was just great. Um, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I had a question in terms of your surface. I've noticed some of them have like Could you extreme. Talk in the microphone? Can you hear me? Um, yeah. The terms of the surface of the gloss areas, um, is, it the, is the gloss coming from the medium you're making, mixing with the, uh, the pigment? Or yeah, is it's more it, oil or less. So oil. no varnish is on top or anything? No, no varnish. Yeah. Just uh, always linseed oil. Sometimes I put a little bit of, of dryer in because that's the yellow was a very slow drying color. And these hematites are very, very slow drying. So I put a, a bit of dryer into it. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. Yeah.